Welcome back to our series on vertebrate diversity. In this video, we're going to focus on the class Aves, the birds. If we look back, uh, we can see the path we've taken in our travel through the vertebrate subphylum. We've worked our way up, and in this video, we're going to talk about the birds, or the class Aves. One of the things I want you to do as we talk about the details of birds is keep in mind these three issues that birds face. Stop the video and build this chart. Anytime we come across a feature or an adaptation that relates to one of these issues, flight, a dry environment, or a very active lifestyle, I want you to make note of it in your chart. Now let's take a, char a look at the characteristics of birds. Now what would you say is the defining feature of birds? What makes a bird a bird? Well it's tempting to say that they have wings, but we have to be careful. Butterflies and other insects have wings as do bats, which are mammals. The defining feature of birds is not the presence of wings, but really the presence of feathers. And interestingly, the feathers are made of the same materials that make the scales in reptiles. It's the suggestion that feathers are just modified scales, that over time and evolution, that feathers evolve from scales. They're derivatives of the skin, just like scales are. They're overlapping in nature. They help prevent water loss. So they are very scale-like in that way. Now we have three different types of feathers. We have down feathers that are closest to the body and help insulate the body. And we have contour feathers which give the body its shape and streamline, uh, streamline shape and its coloration. If I make this bigger, we can see the contour feathers are the ones along the head and the body uh, that give the bird its streamlined shape and lots of coloration. And then the quill feathers, the ones that are involved in the wings and the tail that are directly involved in, in flight. Now, we said that the down feathers uh, can help keep the bird warm, uh, which lets us ask the question about temperature regulation. Now, in all the vertebrates we've talked about up to now, the, the fish and the amphibians and the reptiles, they were all ectotherms, meaning their body temperature is determined by their environment. We mentioned that this was a limiting factor in the habitat possibilities of many of these other animals, especially the terrestrial vertebrates. But what about birds? Can they live in climates where temperatures vary drastically? Can they live where it's cold? Let's look at these pictures and decide. Well, of course, we see quickly that the answer is yes. The next question is, how is this possible? How can birds live in these environments? Well, birds are endotherms. They generate and maintain their body temperature from within. Being a good endotherm is a two-part process. You have to generate heat and trap heat. Well, birds generate excess heat through their fast metabolism. As they break down food, they get energy that they can use, but they also create heat. But the key is also to trap that heat. And they trap that heat with their feathers, especially the down feathers, trap the heat and keep it close to, their, to the body. And so birds can live in a much broader range of habitats than we see for the amphibians and reptiles because of this endothermic nature. This high rate of metabolism also means we have a high rate of nutritional need, meaning we have to eat a lot. Um, birds are so active and have such a high rate of metabolism that they basically have to be eating constantly. So if you hear the phrase that someone eats like a bird, it usually means to say that they don't eat a lot. But in fact, birds do eat a lot. They eat all the time. But that creates a little bit of a problem. All that food in their stomach would weigh them down. Weighing them down creates a problem when your primary means of locomotion is flight. The solution to this, a way to keep our energy level high, is to eat all the time. But they don't eat a lot. They eat, a lar they, they eat frequent but small meals. Um, but the other thing is, they digest very fast. Birds inde ingest, digest, and eliminate very quickly. This allows them to keep their energy level high, but their weight low, which is a uh, an adaptation for both their active lifestyle and their, um, their primary means of, of locomotion, which is, is flying. Now, birds don't have teeth, so they don't chew. But we can look at the shape of a bird's beak. And that tells us a lot about the type of food they eat, whether they're maybe eating berries or nuts or fish or insects uh, or nectar from a plant. The shape of the beak determines the type of food they can eat. Uh, and again, they don't chew, so they have a structure called a gizzard which helps grind food. If we look at this uh, diagram that shows the internal structure, um, anatomy of a bird, we can see the um, digestive system here. As the food goes down, they have a crop, which is kind of like a stomach. It's for storage. 
and they have this structure, a gizzard, which is for grinding. And they move their uh, material through their digestive system at a, at a very fast rate, so they're constantly eliminating waste to keep their weight low. The other part of the elimination uh, system is to get rid of metabolic waste, or cellular waste, and that's the job of the kidney. Uh, our kidneys produce urine, but in birds, uh, urine uh, is mostly water, so for birds, uh, releasing urine would be problematic because um, we live in such a dry environment. Now, as soon as you say that, you talk about birds that live in and around water. I can think of like ducks and that kind of thing, but most birds live in a relatively dry environment, so eliminating excess water is actually problematic. And so birds' kidneys work really hard to reabsorb most of the water and release the waste as a solid or semi-solid, almost crystalline structure called uric acid, which is related to urine, but it's, it's slightly different. And this is a, a directly related to con conserving water, and this uh, uric acid, there it is on someone's car, unfortunately. Uh, it's acidic, so it's bad for your paint, so you need to get off your car as uh, soon as possible. Now let's move on to the skeletal system. Now we know that most birds move about through flight, and flying requires some pretty large uh, pectoral muscles. Think about your chest muscles, which you use to move your arms. So imagine you had to use those to flap wings. Uh, the pectoral muscles are very large, and large muscles need a large surface to uh, attach to. And when we look at the um, bird's uh, skeleton here, we see this bone right here, which is pretty interesting. This is the sternum which is your breastbone, uh, spelled that wrong, sternum, and in the birds it's called a keel. It looks like the bottom of a boat, or uh, which is called the keel, and it's uh, elongated like this, moving kind of out. If you looked at it from, from, the, from the top or the side, it would look like this, and there's lots of surface area here for the flight muscles to attach to. Uh, in your body, your sternum uh, is in the middle of your chest, and it's, it's flat and the pectoral muscles come over and attach to it, but there's not a lot of surface area for them to attach to. By elongating it like this, you give more surface area. There's a, a form relates to function uh, issue right there. The other thing we see about birds' bones is that they're, um, they're referred to as being hollow. And while they're not completely hollow, if we compare them to the bone of a human, there's a lot more empty space inside of a bird's bone. And this is a, a interesting picture of the cross section. And you can see these hollow spaces. And what that's doing is reducing the weight. And again, when you're an animal that flies, weight is a big issue. Just like in an airplane, uh, you don't want it to be too heavy. Uh, the other issue, they have a very thin skull. Uh, a thin skull, again, is for rate reduction. Let's move on to the nervous system and sensory systems. Birds have well-developed brains. Birds are smart. They can learn and unlearn, and they have to coordinate complex muscle movement. Just think about how difficult it would be to, co to coordinate all the movements necessary for flight. And think about how good your sense of or sensory systems need to be to fly. It would be hard to come in to try to land on that limb if your eyesight were poor, and birds have very keen eyesight. Uh, do they have color vision? Well, here's a hint, and here's another hint. Birds have very good color vision. Think about having to be able to pick out um, your mates based on their color of their feathers and which species belongs to you and the color of ripe fruit and berries. Um, the birds have a well-developed sense of hearing. Uh, they have ears. You don't see the hear o ear openings because they're covered by feathers, but we know that birds hear. We know that birds sing, and the vocal communication is very important to birds, that uh, very specific bird songs help species identify each other and are very important for social behaviors such as mating behaviors. Uh, their sense of taste and smell, mm, not as good. Now let's move on to the circulatory system. Birds have a complete four-chambered heart. There's no mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Now we need to remind ourselves what we learned in our past videos. In a fish circulatory system, we have a two-chambered heart, an atrium and a ventricle, and a circulatory system that's a single loop. Now, while it's simple, it doesn't mean it's inefficient. In fact, it's fairly efficient. When we move to the adult amphibian, we saw a three-chambered heart, two atria, and a single ventricle, and two loops, a pulmonary loop and a systemic loop. But we said that the problem with this system is that it was inefficient because we had a mixing of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood in the single ventricle, sending a mixture back out to both loops. Uh, but the amphibians made up for this inefficiency by having additional gas exchange across their skin. And when we move to the reptile, 
uh, this problem became less because we had a partial wall in the ventricle which subdivided the ventricle not completely but somewhat which reduced the amount of mixing uh, which was l less inefficient or not as inefficient as the amphibians uh, circulatory system and then in the crocodilians we had a complete four team at heart like we see in the birds and mammals so let's draw one so here's my four chambered heart. I paused while I drew because I don't want to take up the time. But here's my right atrium on the animal's right side, but my paper's left side, and the right ventricle. And we have a left atrium and a left ventricle. And so our two sides of the heart are completely separated from each other, so we have no mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. If I add in the loops here, the right ventricle is going to send blood out to the lungs and so we can put the lungs on this side and bring it back the lungs brings the from the lungs we bring blood back to the left atrium from the left atrium to left ventricle from the left ventricle we send blood out to the body or the systems and so we call this the systemic loop and over here on this side we have the pulmonary loop whoops got to pick up my pen again pulmonary loop. And if we look at where blood gets oxygenated, we pick up oxygen in the lungs, so we have oxygen-rich blood coming back into the left atrium, from left atrium to left ventricle, and from the left ventricle we pump the blood out to the body. So this oxygen-rich blood goes to the body where it drops off oxygen and picks up carbon dioxide, and we have oxygen-poor blood returning from the body into the right atrium from the right atrium into the right ventricle, and from the right ventricle to the pulmonary loop, we send the blood to the lungs to get oxygenated. Now let's move to the gas exchange system of birds. Now birds have to have a very efficient gas exchange system. Again, they have a very high metabolic rate, they're using a lot of oxygen, they're burning lots of fuel, so we'd have an efficient system. And birds have a very efficient gas exchange system. Uh, the air comes in uh, to the uh, gas exchange system, and down it to the lungs and here's the lung but additional to the lungs we have all these extra little sacs off the lungs these extra air sacs play a very important role in the efficiency of the birds gas exchange system when the air first comes into the system I'm drawing it red because it's very oxygen rich and we exchange we take oxygen in and in return we drop off carbon dioxide so then the air in the lungs is um, oxygen poor and we exhale this oxygen poor blood but here's the interesting thing while the exchange is going on here in the lungs we've tucked some air away back in these um, air sacs so we fill these air sacs with good fresh air and we're not exchanging gases there and when the bird exhales all this air that we've been holding in reserve comes back through the lungs on exhale and we get this burst, this boost of oxygen on exhale. So we get oxygen on inhale and an oxygen boost on exhale. And it's a very efficient system. We'll talk a little bit more about it in class, but uh, if you get the gist of it here, uh, the point is we have a very, uh, very efficient uh, gas exchange system in birds. Flying is an energy expensive um, means of locomotion. I mean, go out and try it, flap your arms and see how fast you get tired. Um, and so again, birds have to can get a lot of calories in, they have to eat a lot, and they have to burn their fuel very fast. And to do that, you need to keep an oxygen supply come in in a very efficient manner, and these air sacs allow for that efficiency. And finally, let's talk about reproduction. Birds, like the reptiles, are amniotes. Uh, also, the uh, mammals are also amniotes, but the birds, like reptiles, lay eggs. Now, they have a hard-shelled egg compared to the leathery shell of the reptiles, but it is an amniotic egg, and these eggs have to be incubated. Think about these. These are our, our endothermic animals. They need to be kept warm. And if we look at a bird egg up close, it has the same extra embryonic membranes that we saw in the reptile egg. We have the amnion, this fluid-filled sac that the embryo develops in, the protective sac. We have the uh, chorion, which is for gas exchange, uh, oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. We have the allantois, which is where we uh, store the waste products, mostly uric acid. And we have, of course, the yolk sac, which is filled with nutrients. Recall it was the evolution of this amniotic egg that allowed 
the vertebrates to become terrestrial, allowed them to uh, complete their reproduction on land. So this is a major uh, thing for, for all amniotes. A couple other quick notes about birds. There's an interesting thing to look at the, how birds are related to reptiles. We already talked about feathers being made of the same material as scales, but birds have scales. If you look at this picture and this picture, you see the scales on the parts of the skin where there's not, uh, where there are not feathers, and the claws on the end of their toes uh, that you see here. This is very reptilian uh, in, in nature. So there's a there's certainly a, a relationship between reptiles and birds. Um, birds probably evolved from some type of early reptile. Uh, another just random thing is that birds, uh, female birds only have one ovary and that's a, a weight reduction issue by losing that redundant feature. Now here's the thing about birds. While they're beautiful and powerful and even majestic, I'll be honest, birds kind of creep me out. I think maybe I saw this movie when I was too young and I kind of get the sense they're always just watching and waiting. Come back for our next video on mammals.